Welcome everyone, and this is the 27th edition of our webinar series, our series for small business navigating the impacts of COVID-19. I'm Barbara Coffey, Director of Economic Initiatives for the City of Tucson, and today we'll take a look at what's happening in the world of arts and entertainment. As always, we will take your questions as we go, so feel free to enter those in the chat box or the Q&A, and we'll get to as many of those as possible in our time together this afternoon. We'll keep all participants muted since we do have a large number of attendees, but we do record the session and we'll make it available for everyone uh, by tomorrow afternoon. You can find links to all previous webinars at connecttucson.com. And typically, again, those will be available uh, after noon tomorrow. Uh, let's get started. First up, Kate Marquez is Executive Director at the Southern Arizona Arts and Cultural Alliance and founder of Catalyst, the collaborative arts and makerspace that opened last year in Tucson Mall. Kate is a Tucson native and University of Arizona grad, and in 2006, she accepted a position as the first full-time development director for the Greater Oro Valley Arts Council, which eventually became the Southern Arizona Arts and Cultural Alliance, one of the largest multidisciplinary presenting arts organizations in the region. Each year, SACA provides thousands of opportunities for artists in the community to present and exhibit their artwork through culinary, arts, and music-based events and festivals, as well as groundbreaking arts and healthcare integrated programming and arts education outreach. Kate founded the statewide Arizona Business Committee for the Arts, which is centered on arts and business integration programs. Kate is the 2017 winner of the Inside Tucson Business Nonprofit CEO of the Year and two-time nominee for the Arizona Governor's Arts Awards and currently serves on the Americans for the Arts Private Sector Advisory Council. In 2019, Kate opened the 14,000 square foot Catalyst Collaborative Arts and Makerspace, which is home to a teaching kitchen, robotics and engineering lab, arts and crafts studio, and music and digital arts production studio. Now alongside Kate today is Ignacio Garcia, an artist here in Southern Arizona, who has been doing quite a lot of amazing work in the community during this pandemic and quarantine. He's also an artist in residence at Catalyst, as well as a board of director for the Southern Arizona Arts and Cultural Alliance. I'm excited to welcome them both and anxious to hear their stories. Kate, I'll turn it over to you, welcome. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, it's wonderful to actually be back in our space. Uh, Catalyst Arts and Maker Space had opened in December of 2019, and um, unfortunately, we only were able to have about three months to open the public, but it was an extraordinary uh, first few months, and uh, with this pandemic hitting, we've certainly had to be, as anyone in the arts, as um, collaborative and um, idea driven as uh, all of the arts industry has had to be through uh, this difficult time. So I know one of the things that we were really on in today's uh, webinar is how have the arts continued to uh, stay active during this time away. So speaking a bit from our organization, uh, one of the very first things that we did uh, when uh, everything was shut down uh, for us, it was tough in March because, of course, we're still here in Southern Arizona in festival season. So we had several festivals back to back. We ended up having to cancel one uh, just seven hours before it was uh, a large one ready to uh, move to the community. So uh, I think for the several weeks, we absolutely were in, um, you know, safety mode, trying to figure out what what could be done and what could be done. So I think that one of our 12 staff at that time, of course, was working, you know, 18, 19 hour days trying to figure out what the future would bring and try to come up with new ways uh, for our organization to continue to serve the community, which at that time in March and April was changing by the day, sometimes the hour. So uh, when the dust had settled a bit after the first month, we really focused in on uh, what were what was the artist community going to need? So the very first thing that we did was start to collaborate with um, all of the other arts organizations and individual artists here in Southern Arizona um, on getting up and running a digital streaming platform for um, and resource, kind of a clearinghouse, so to speak, for uh, all the different organizations and individual artists that started putting content online very quickly. 
So at SACA.org, we were able to establish over 30 different uh, organizations and over 25 different artists that were presenting work in one place. So uh, that was one of our first big projects. And then of course, some of the early questions that were coming in are how do I better my online streaming capacities? How do, um, how do I teach myself things like social media overnight if that hasn't really been my platform if you're a visual artist or uh, other social media? platform. So we also started introducing some uh, really dynamic training resources, um, online resources for people wanting to promote their work. Um, a, lot of talk also, a lot of people know us for, um, you know, more recently Catalyst, but uh, for the longest time, a lot of the work that we've done in um, arts and healthcare. So the, the next area that we focused, because we knew that they were getting hit the hardest and quickly, was our senior care communities. Uh, to date, SACA has worked with over 20 of those facilities here in Southern Arizona, residencies as well as hospitals, and we knew they needed something. So we went back to our artist community and said, um, how can you help us serve uh, these individuals that are going to be in isolation for a very long period of time? So uh, within just 45 days, we were able to provide over 5,000 uh, seniors and individuals receiving treatment in um, hospitals and senior care, nursing, uh, memory care facilities, with, uh, really extraordinarily inspiring care packages. Uh, we had over 5,000 items actually uh, donated from local artists, whether those were CDs, whether those were small art kits, uh, textiles, sewing kits, you name it, uh, those were all donated and we were able to put 100% of those back in the hands of uh, individuals in this community. We also, uh, the space that we're in here at Catalyst, uh, we knew what are we going to now do with 14 square feet. Um, it provided a really unique opportunity for artists to be able to continue their work uh, during uh, this time of distance. It's a large space. Um, as you can see, is actually the other uh, rooms and um, the space itself has about 12 different unique spaces that people can work in. So we went back to the community and offered this space and said, what do you need it for? So over the last seven months, we have a public art uh, project, a large uh, uh, public art piece that's actually being installed uh, in the Middle East and produced Catalyst. Had over uh, 12 artists painting live in the windows uh, throughout the last seven months. We've had, uh, we have actually a culinary uh, artist uh, moving in today to be able to work on a month long project. We have architects, we have uh, musicians recording in this space, uh, you name it. So the space has actually stayed pretty active, although not open to the public. Uh, we've also, in terms of our external programs, continued to present some events. So we really uh, started working with a lot of the communities we serve throughout the state and said, how can we safely bring arts and cultural distance experiences? So what that's produced is over uh, 27 mural commissions and painting commissions in the community over the last seven months, um, large and small, uh, throughout the state. Uh, we've also continued uh, to produce some artisan markets. We really felt uh, one of the things that artists know us specifically for um, are our opportunities for them to sell and promote their work. So we've been able to preserve a, a good amount of those smaller socially distanced art experiences for artists to monetize uh, what they do. Uh, and we've also been able to provide some unique socially distanced uh, gallery opportunities. So uh, Saka also has about seven community galleries that we manage. We were able to get each and every one of those up in a digital virtual experience. So you can be standing in the gallery uh, from your computer. And we know a lot of museums and uh, art spaces have gone to these virtual experiences. So we've been able to provide that uh, to all of the artists who were exhibiting who lost that opportunity um, to promote their work in gallery spaces. Uh, so, it's been a, a really busy seven months for us. We, of course, have been hit devastatingly hard. Uh, you know, in March, we had 12 full-time employees, we're two full-time employees, and um, some part-time support. Uh, the, we know that this is going to be a sustained for five to 10 years uh, impact. 
the arts and cultural industries. So uh, we think about that daily. There's never a time that it's not um, in the forefront of our thoughts. Uh, and uh, just to point to probably the most significant thing that we've accomplished over the last uh, seven months is um, in May, Saka felt that um, it was really important to better understand what um, the impact was going to be for individual artists, so, um, because that's who we directly work with um, the majority of the time. So we uh, launched a creative sector survey. We had almost uh, 700 responses to that survey um, over three months. We were able to um, compile all of that, how we define the creative sector is a little bit broad. Uh, we see the creative sector in Southern Arizona as not just the profession, artists producing work, um, whether that be crafters, whether that be painters, musicians. We also see as our designers, uh, our um, computer software, um, game engineers, see that as our literary arts um, assets here in Southern Arizona, our authors, our writers, um, our culinary arts um, sector. So uh, that uh, creative sector survey was really dynamic for our organization because we didn't want to just on what we knew was going to be the best, which was um, how this is affecting everybody. We also want to understand is how do we build our community after this as um, even a stronger community uh, foundation for arts and culture uh, sector support. Um, as many people know, there is um, not a permanent funding stream in Southern Arizona uh, for the arts. Uh, we believe fundamentally that that is important for the future of our art sector. Um, but we also know that um, engagement, collaboration, and uh, involvement in all levels of decision making um, from our art sector is going to be needed to um, really catapult us into the future. So um, in that creative sector report, we learned a lot of how our artistic community wants to see their voice be executed um, into the future and their ideas of um, how we could actually uh, functionally build that into the future. So that creative sector report is really what's gonna help redefine our organization and the collaborative work that we're going to be doing over the next uh, five to 10 years. And um, all things, it's in our mission, it's in our vision, everything that SACA does is collaborative. So we know we're not going to be able to get to that point um, until and, um, continue to expand that. And this is an important way to do that just this way today. So with that, uh, I guess I'll turn it over to Ignacio, who has been a very active uh, voice in a lot of the so in Saka's work, but beyond anything Saka, he is an artist, he is a resident here in Southern Arizona, um, and he's been doing a lot of uh, really innovative things and rethinking his strategies as an artist. Right. Can you hear me? Yes, awesome. Oh, okay. Welcome. Okay. Hey, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, well, um, Saka has been a, a big impact in my life um, ever, ever since, what, 10 years ago uh, when, I, when we're doing like chalk art. Uh, immediately was how they were in tune with artists, how they, much they really cared for the artists and, and, and really valued them. And because of that, I knew there was something special. So since then, I was going back and forth from here in LA, and then finally moving down, they they were like trying to grab me. It's like this put you on the board member, and so now I'm the board member now. And then because of that, the impact that um, Saga has uh, provided me, um, it's just um, knowing like the connection that they really relate to the artist. That was that's that to me uh, has always been, and will always be. Um, on how they um, treasure the, the artist um, because their energy is on them, you know? And, and, and because of that, I, you know, I've always felt like I needed a place to where I belong. And, and, then, and then as time was going, you, you start, I, like every time I, I take off to LA and I come back and as every year started coming by, uh, it's just seemed to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And see new artists, new talent and, um, and thinking they're all in the same like-minded, as innovative and, and ambitious as an artist as, as they can be. And being surrounded in a community like that, it's very empowering, very, very empowering. So, um, so now that um, now I'm a resident here at Catalyst, um, I really devoted a lot of my time here 
as an artist because it has the space um, and and overall you're in a community and you're you're in a little smaller community with full of talent and innovators and um, and and we're always here to, and overall too we're always here to um, to help each other out one way or another um, and it's, you know as artists we need that you know we're not you know it's not always about money or um, trying to hustle or anything like that. It's just trying to have a place where you can express yourself. And just that is such a motivation and a lifting spirit that um, an artist needs, especially nowadays. And even, even 10 years before that, I mean, even the art movement was sluggish. So it was, you know, even the art was very devalued for many years. Now, finally, it's finally catching up to knowing that the, the empower, how, art can be very empowerful and um so catalyst and Sokka, it's it they're the ones who can allow you to give you that voice so i'm a huge fan i mean and even dedicating my time just to kind of during covid i mean this place was um you know closed to the public all the lights were out and i was like you know what i got to make this place look like it's happening there's something so i was devoting a lot of my time and just because I, how much i believed in catalyst and so, that's the reflection that they, they offer to the to, to everyone. Yeah. So that, I love the perspective and I want you to share, share a little bit about what your art first, what you create, oh. what you do. Okay, hold on, I'll on. show you. So this is, okay, so with Catalyst, here's some murals that I painted. These are actually, if you, I don't know if you can see these little uh, engineering things. Yes. Is, well, I'm actually in the robotics room. I just came in here. I was actually in the, um, in the teaching kitchen section and um, I'll show you really quick but I mean you can see how big the space is I don't know have you been here there's a little stage so but um, I don't know if you were here when I was painting but uh, in this space here you can see like I did this mural here as well and because of the um, what I've noticed with other artists they come here um, just having paint uh, like a mural or anything that's uh, kind of that has any kind of art uh, element to it it helps them to kind of get more inspired especially when you have um, something that is more um, connected to the community and it has diversity and um, so so it's good for me to that it's good for Sokka and myself and, and, and having everyone's ideas put into this building um, helps everyone out so and that, um, this is the works that I've done here. Let's see if I can squeeze my way in here. Um, so during the time of COVID, uh, it's been, so, it was so depressing. Um, and then when we we're at quarantine at the house, I had no, no way of inspiration. You know, you can't talk to people, you can't socialize and there's no way to express yourself. So I felt like a bird in a cage, you can't even fly. And mentally, and like I was, I was getting like depressed. I was getting um, anxiety in a sense, or mental breakdown. And so, and then finally, um, you know, I, I, getting the opportunity to kind of paint at Catalyst, it, that helped me out a lot tremendously. And so, with this, this is my other collection here. This is like the Sonoran Street art. Hold on, let me see if I can wipe yeah. off this much here. Um, so. You can see this was one of the first pieces. It's called Sonoran Street Dog. Oh no, it's actually right here. I'm sorry. I can't even see. Actually, you know, let me, let me flip it over. That may be better. Sorry. That's fantastic. So okay, so it's because all these elements, because I've been painting murals for many years, almost 20 years. So having the um, the street painting on the streets and painting public murals. So I'm trying to bring that to something close to their home you know and uh so here's something like every time i'm painting out in public out on the streets there's always a pigeon you know <laughs> so there's always there so kind of all these little elements i mean you even can see the texture of the the colors the contrast and little maybe a little ant there you know so any little details but when i was during the COVID, when a lot of the employment was happening i thought of this i don't know if you noticed this character he's a He's a, uh, he's cheese, uh, is a cheese pirito. He's a, uh, I don't know, it's like, I don't even call it, like a little like comedian from the 1970s and 80s. So this, he was a kid that lived in a barrel. So he was always get picked on because he was poor. 
And so now as adults, as parents, it's like, um, you know, this is where says little orphan daddy. So it's just very sentimental in a sense. Like it says, who can save me now? No one can defend me. So, and the same thing with this other character, same character, but this is, a, this is like the Mexican superhero saying, you know, it says, you know, the little sign that says road, road work ahead and it says no work. Uh -huh. So it's the same thing. So he's standing, he's standing alone. So, and this is with the quarantine where people are at their home and they're, you know, underwear, I guess. I don't know. It's just something weird. That's but, awesome. you know, but, you know, these are very, very, and of course, the Loteria. I was just kind of testing out the colors on these ones. Um, there's more of these here. So no, this was, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I want to ask you, what, what do you think are some of the lessons learned from the challenges of this year of this pandemic for you? What, what do you learn? What were maybe some, maybe some shining moments or the aha moments or maybe some... What? what i learned um it grounded me definitely grounded me um and 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 really focus on what my talent is what i could use utilize my talent for instead of like a business as before it was just business with work clients and everything and it was great but taking that away and then you kind of re-identify yourself and you realize you got to get grounded you, you really need to kind of rediscover yourself and that's what i needed it was literally kind of like a slap in the face but it was a, but everyone was going through it. So I didn't, I didn't feel alone. So, so during this epidemic, um, I had to find a way to kind of get inspired, but overall catalyst was a great way to kind of really push it forward. So I could not do that without catalyst. And, um, and so, but what the, what really helped me out to get motivated was, um, the support, the support with the community, with the art community, with catalyst. Uh, because we were all in the same same boat and we just needed each other to push each other and really um, Help each other out. So this is the reason why I stayed here to really show everyone like okay I'm, I'm the only one here painting, but I was giving that little spark. It's like I'm not giving up I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up and so sure enough slowly this and then I started having crowds around me when I'm painting because there's a glass wall in front of me and and it seems like there's like a little it seems like people are just coming back just to see the artist and just to show the um the passion that i have uh with Sokka and catalyst is something that i kind of want to reflect back how important catalyst is and uh and how they treat artists and how much they dedicate themselves to it and sacrifice so it's a reflection of what they do and i kind of like reflecting back and that's hands down you know a lot of respect no, I appreciate that perspective. And I think it's very, you know, it's not unlike what we see in many of our organizations that help small business in other industry sectors, right? So like yeah. Star Tucson or The Forge or UACI, some of the business incubation and others, they come together for that support. And you're describing the, how important that is. And, and and during, you know, the early days of the pandemic, you had to figure out where to connect in and how, how to do that quickly so that you can yeah. keep stay motivated so absolutely i mean what do you see are the opportunities going forward what will you do next what's the next big thing for you for myself i've been trying to get this collection going um it's been difficult because i have these murals that just been wanting my work and i just can't say no they're a big fan of my work and but um but i realized that you know what there's no rush for this i have a place that i can express myself and as long as I'm being myself and true to myself, um, the collection will come to, together. Um, I'm already, I already got offered that Mocha is really is wanting to do an exhibition with me. And so I'm excited. And just, I mean, it's funny because while I'm being, painting these, uh, these pieces, they see it and they immediately want to buy it. And they come in and they just buy it. It's like, it's not even finished. I'll finish it by tonight. Like, just here's the money. I'll come back tomorrow and get it. And, uh, so I wish I wish you would have seen the other cool pieces that I've gotten, and, and they're just remarkable. They're very um, has a lot of um, uh, impact into them, and immediately they just they just sold. Um, and so, um, but so, that's yeah. Go ahead. Well, they say some of the best artist work, right, come out of trying times. Would you agree? <laughs> that, has that also been able to come across in your expressions? Absolutely. Now I realize throughout history why, why all these masters can become very um, successful. And it, it always leads down to the to these uh, hard times. I mean, through the, 
you know, the, you know, down to the Picasso times and, and then down to the uh, Warhol and uh, Basquiat in the 80s. And now it's happening again. History is literally repeating itself. I was mentioning that to Kate. I was like, Kate, we got to, we got to, we got to really push this forward. And uh, showing up, sure enough, because this street art that, I, that I'm seeing, because I was mentioning to her, it's like, you know, you got abstract, you got contemporary, you got modern. Now street art is actually becoming a new genre of, of works, you know what I mean? Through, through Banksy and Obey. But now after 10 years later, well, now it's in demand now. That's the, that's the style I work, the style I work. And, and overall, when I was in LA, I was part of that uh, movement and seeing, it, and seeing that um, develop. So I wanted to bring that here to Tucson, but more of a Sonoran style. And that it's really cool. Uh, but you can't, I, I'm, I'm already ex excited to start working on my new pieces. I'm already thinking of these really crazy, cool ideas. Um, but one thing I'm going to say, I'm going to just secretly going to say this, but um, one is one piece is called the Tamale Lady. So, you know, all the little husk of the tamales is going to be kind of around. And so it's going to be, real, that's all I'm going to say, but that's one of the pieces that I'm going to work out. It's going to be really interesting, but that's the representation where I was seen in, uh, in the Soren Desert or Tucson. And, uh, and especially being a Mexican American and all that, so yeah. Awesome. See, everyone that's attending got a sneak peek of that. So that's. <laughs> yeah. Now yeah. Kelly had a question. She asked, "Where have you been selling your work?" Um, she's been watching you paint uh, at the mall, the Catalyst location. Um, uh -huh. she wonders where you're selling, and and so talk about that. And and has that been difficult to to find during these times? Absolutely, it was. Um, I haven't had, I have, the last ex, uh, exhibition that I had or collection I had was 10 years ago. And uh, it was a collection called Narco Nation. It was the art of drug trafficking, basically the, what the, what was happening during the time of the, the war that was happening next door. It was just reflecting on that. And um, because of the, um, hold on. Uh, we got oh, so, um, so because of that, um, it, it, it took it to the next level, but I had to stop. Uh, that collection actually got stolen. So that was devastating. And long story short, I mean, but these works are remarkable. So then, um, so then I had a, so then I wanted to get back to it again. So after now 10 years later, now I'm actually uh, re, re, refining it again, more of more, more that defines myself instead of like what's happening in the world. Um, so that's exactly what I'm doing now. Um, just by coincidence, there's actually, they're being sold here while I'm painting them. Yeah, yeah. It's not like, um, and you know, just people that see it, they want actually something that's customized, like sure, here's that, but it's just, I still haven't had enough time to, to complete the collection because it just keeps getting sold, which is great. I'm honored and flattered, but um, it's just, I realized that when you put in the quality work after those years of hard work, it actually shows. Yeah. And, uh, but, um, hopefully, once this collection is done, I really I'm so excited to kind of get it going and so to show the the public and uh, what the what what I can what my style and my uh, uh, my expression is to, right. to to provide for Tucson. Well, feel free in the chat. Uh, there's folks that have asked. I know Teresa's asked, is there a way uh, an app or a map online to find your art pieces or an Ignacio art tour, she says. But if there's a way for them to find you or reach you or see some of your works, maybe you can share that. Oh, yeah. Um, right now on Instagram, I haven't been on Instagram because I've been painting all these murals like crazy. Um, if you, there's the mural um, tour, too. You can see all my works there, too, as well. Um, if, if, if you can just Google my name, Ignacio Garcia. Um, muralist in Tucson all the there's a lot of things that that can lead you to all the where all the spots are going to be there. I just finished two large murals for the Biden campaign of the uh this is for uh, uh for the Latino voters and I was quite surprised that this people from DC looking for me to paint something for Tucson wow. and I'm just I'm, I'm still like in shock by that so but it just shows all that hard work that um it's it's showing you know right Congratulations. But, uh, yeah, and then, uh, and then my Instagram would be uh, uh, Ignacio underscore Garcia underscore art. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, and so I appreciate that. I, I want to ask Kate to, you know, while, while the visual artists and, and maybe someone like yourself can work more independently, Kate, can you give a flavor of what some of the performance artists have had to go through or what they've experienced, sort of maybe the contrast, those who needed an ensemble or the, you know, symphony or, you know, you name it, but what has it been like for those folks and how have they fared over the last several months? You know, I think one 
kind of, uh, I think we all agree that uh, probably one of the most fundamental things that's gotten us through uh, the last seven months has been art and music in particular and sharing that work online. And um, I think Southern Arizona has one of the most diverse music cultures um, here in this, as we were in a lot of communities and Tucson. There's probably 90 of the people um, our musicians are, uh, they're not necessarily do it professionally, paid. they're passionate about it and they love it. And uh, so a lot of musicians were really forged in terms of getting online or collaborating with other musicians, other organizations, a lot of great music organizations here in Southern Arizona. Uh, so we've just seen a lot of collaboration and um, a lot of online promotion. So, and they've gotten really creative with, um, you can eat social distance with, you know, three musicians in the backyard. And you've just seen some really um, kind of ingenious, you no know, hearing list. We were very nervous of um, beginning. To and just two weeks ago, we were host uh, the Arizona Symphony Orchestra and their social distance kind of experimental uh, performance, as well as their first opportunity to really uh, full performance online. So they're able to both use this facility to promote the the music, but also in-person concerts and find out some things. So musicians um, are hungry, but also uh, healing through music that they're creating during this time. Uh, I've also been known for a lot of bands, a lot of people who love to play music, but what we're seeing for this is a lot of original music. And I think that's the change the dialogue uh, in the next two years that you see a lot of um, artists that are really creating and writing at a high level or, uh, before. So uh, exciting. The struggle will continue to be, um, we need venues, we need more advocacy for venues, um, whether they're, you know, small restaurants or uh, large performance venues. Uh, they've been hit the hardest, of course, continue to be hit the hardest, but more opportunity for musicians to perform and uh, that easier. Of course, there's a lot, a lot of little things that stand in the way like ASCAP and um, some, you know, stronger forces from the outside that disallow that. But we want to see that change in the community because a year from now when we are able uh, to start really convening more in person, you're going to see a lot of great original music come out of Arizona from this time. Fantastic. That's great. And I appreciate that. And that's the perfect segue uh, for moving on to our, our next panelist, because I know that um, our live entertainment venues are suffering the worst, and they're going to continue to suffer into the months ahead. So I would love to hear um, that perspective. And we will. Adriana Gallego is Executive Director for the Arts Foundation for Tucson and Southern Arizona. She serves on the board of directors of Grant Makers in the Arts and MAP Fund and is a member of the Projecting All Voices Design Integration Team with Arizona State University. Prior to joining the Arts Foundation, Adriana was the first Chief Operating Officer of the National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures, Director of Strategic Initiatives with the Arizona Commission on the Arts, and an Educational Assistant at the Norton Simon Museum. Adriana has also been an arts educator throughout the Southwest and is a founding member of Raices Taller 222 Gallery and Workshop. Her panel and committee service include a long list of organizations, the National Endowment for the Arts, Arizona Mexico Commission, Arizona Public Art Network, Transportation Enhancement Review Committee, Community Foundation of Southern Arizona, Tucson Pima Arts Council, Asset Building for Artists of Color Advisory Board, Flagstaff Cultural Partners Arts Advisory Board, Dance USA Fellowship, I'm not done yet, Nevada Arts Council Visual Arts Fellowship, New Mexico Public Art Program, Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, Tempe Arts and Culture, Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture, Public Art Program, Alternate Roots, New York Foundation for the Arts Immigrant Artist Program, and the Smithsonian Latino Center Young Ambassadors Program. Wow, now I can take a breath. So it's evident Adriana is steeped in the arts community here and plugged in nationally and internationally as well. Welcome, Adriana. Thanks for joining today. Thank you so much, Barbara, for the warm and long introduction. Apologies uh, for the list. Uh, but actually, I'm very proud of the, 
the opportunities that I was able to harness while I lived here um, in my hometown of Tucson, which is just 45 minutes away from my birthplace of, of Nogales, Sonora, and Arizona. Um, really, um, the arts community was uh, so uh, vibrant and continues to be vibrant and continues to provide uh, the resources and support that individual artists need to make a viable career in the arts and also to turn the ordinary into the extraordinary, which is exactly the expertise that artists and arts administrators bring to the table. Um, I feel you, Ignacio, uh, as a, as a, what, seeing your paintings makes me want to get my brushes back out, get onto the scaffolding and, okay. and really start um, and, and start producing art. Um, it's absolutely beautiful work. Um, and I was going to ask you before I begin, uh, did you do that UFO painting on Speedway? And I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. Are you serious? It. Oh yeah, my I'll goodness, it's a masterpiece. I love it. I drive by it all the time. I'll and be there my tomorrow. Husband. Are you serious? Oh gotta, my goodness. Yeah, I gotta start tomorrow. Um, I, my, my, my iPad's gonna uh, die. I'm gonna switch it over to my phone real quick, okay? Sorry. Okay, great. Um, so, anyway, I'm, I'm a little starstruck right now, but if Barbara, if it's okay with you, I'll go ahead and share my... Um, my screen, see if I can get this uh, right and not share emails, but actually share some PowerPoints. Right. Um, okay, I'm gonna do this one. Uh, let's see, share screen. There you go. Good. This might be a little date. Remind me when to stop sharing because okay. I've been known to continue sharing beyond. So I am the Pink Soon Executive Director of the Arts Foundation. Uh, that was my first day on the job seven months ago at the onset of the, um, at the, of the pandemic. Our uh, mission is to enhance artistic expression, civic participation, and equitable economic growth of our diverse communities by supporting, promoting, and advocating for arts and culture in our region. Uh, our vision is to uh, do our work through forward-thinking, accountable leadership. We anticipate that we will work to affect systemic change that fosters an accessible, diverse, inclusive, and equitable local arts community. We do this uh, through four core service areas, which includes direct funding to individual artists and arts organizations, providing technical assistance and professional development. We have uh, a robust online resource, which uh, is going to get a new look on our website very soon. And of course, we manage all of the public art projects and programs for the city and the county. We acknowledge and, um, and are respectful of the fact that we live and work in unceded traditional sovereign lands of the Kechan tribe, Cocopa tribe, Tohono O'odham Nation, Pascuayaki tribe, Akchen Indian community, Gila River Indian community, and San Carlos Apache tribe. Uh, we are beholden to all communities south of the Gila River, which includes 372 miles of the U.S.-Mexico border and 590 miles across the state of the Gila River, which uh, neighbors uh, California, Colorado River to Nuevo Mexico. In a nutshell, the Arts Foundation is responsible um, for providing uh, services to 20% of Arizona communities. What do we know about our Southern Arizona residents? Uh, based on the latest census, which will be up to very soon, uh, we understand that our communities self-identify as 36% white, 53% Latinx, 3% Black, 2.3% Native American, 1.96% Asian, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, 0.24%, and two or more races at 2.23%. We uplift these demographics so that we can begin to understand how it is that we're serving our communities and to ensure that we're being equitable in our outreach, in our service, in our inclusivity, and in our collaboration. Uh, what do we know about our residents? Furthermore, is that we are younger than the rest of the state. 
and the United States. We're twice more bilingual, and um, unfortunately, uh, more of us live in, more of our residents live in poverty as compared to Arizona and to the United States. More of our residents live without health insurance, earn less per capita, have less access to broadband internet, have access to less home computers, and um, nationally we are in education funding, um, for public funding for education, and 47th in arts funding. So these stats are very sobering, and this is all information that is pre-pandemic. Uh, um, so this is uh, the baseline by which we started uh, working and by which I, you know, I entered the, the Arts Foundation. So in the last seven months, uh, we have really hunkered down as a staff of three uh, to be able to use the access to resources that we have access to so that we can distribute them broadly and widely throughout our community. During the first two weeks of my tenure, uh, we applied for a $250,000 grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, and we were one of nine national local arts agencies who received the full funding to be able to distribute funding to all of our uh, communities in Southern Arizona. This is of particular significant to us as a Southern Arizona serving arts organization because um, in 2016, formerly known as TPAC, Tucson Pima Arts Council, um, made a decision to be more responsive to the needs of our neighbors um, outside of the scope of Tucson and Pima County, understanding our full access to resources as one of the biggest metropolitan cities in, in the country. Well, not biggest, but a big metropolitan city in the country. Um, and knowing that we have access to resources that we can then uh, be able to uh, provide to our rural areas, our border regions, and start to collaborate with our, our tribal neighbors to be able to ensure that resources get to the hands of people uh, who need them and serve them and are working in arts and culture. So in the last seven months, we launched seven uh, programs Six of them were new and they were all COVID relief programs. Uh, I think we're about to launch another one, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a little bit. And so uh, in a nutshell, um, we have over $1.4 million that we have secured through donors, through grants, and through partnerships with the city of Tucson uh, to be able to support um, the, the local, regional, and southern arts um, uh, and creative sector. We also uh, took a chance and, and migrated um, our open studio tours, which uh, annually serves over 200 artists. We migrated that platform to completely online virtual experience. Registrations are free and they're open to every um, a Pima County artist and surrounding area that would like to um, sign up online and upload your pictures, give people a link to where your where people can find and buy your artwork and um, voila, uh, we are uh, offering a Zoom virtual studio tours that artists can sign up for to give that full experience for consumers and artists at a time when uh, being able to work in person together and make those transactions may pose a bit of a safety hazard uh, for many of our communities, um, especially considering that many of, of the roles of our family members are changing and increasing and um, it may be harder for people to welcome individuals into their studios. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't an organization that was going to cancel on open studio tours, but instead open it up in a different way. And I believe that nationally, we're probably at the avant-garde of this. Uh, we haven't seen many open studio tours that have continued beyond what's been shared, of course, um, 
Similarly, uh, uh, SACA has shared some great marketplaces that they've uh, been hosting and sponsoring. Uh, we also launched a five-part series of professional development workshops for Black women creatives here in Southern Arizona. That um, workshop is in full swing right now, and it's an opportunity for women to connect with each other and connect to a larger national network uh, to foster and uh, a and, and nurture a, a more collaborative uh, relationship, networking, and peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. And of course, we've been managing over 30 active city and county public art projects, as well as donations, special projects, relocations, deaccessions, and maintenance. I see a trend here in terms of my affinity for lists. So I'm, I'm almost done with this listing part of the presentation. Uh, we're also very happy to be partnering with KXCI to feature artists um, through the radio and talk a little bit more about their work. And those interviews are hosted by our board president, Eva Romero. And we do arts Instagram takeovers that just started out in the last seven months as well. And um, as I mentioned, we've got a new website forthcoming. We've seen our arts and culture uh, sector here in Arizona really uh, stand up in a very resilient way, pivoting and making sure that um, they were not going to cancel opportunities for people to feel alive. And so we've seen people sharing broadcasting kits um, from radio doing radio broadcasting from home like kxci giving volunteers take home kits with microphones and headsets zoom guitar lessons virtual cooking classes doing binational asset mapping uh finding safe mosaic glass art making kits doing steam curriculums online poetry readings on the radio virtual gallery shows cinema screenings outside um read the children's museum for a few hours for you and your family alone i mean even the u of a is creating safety masks for wind-based instruments i mean we are really seeing that this um, transformative moment that was thrown upon us and uh, through the lens of a pandemic is actually giving um, our arts and culture community an opportunity to show what our strengths are and that is thinking outside of the box and that's why artists and arts administrators are going to be so important in the rebuilding process because that cognitive labor, that creative capacity to see things differently, to, to know the nuance between cadence or between different colors and a value scale. Um, we need that kind of, uh, of tuning to see where the opportunities are uh, once we, we get a, a moment to breathe and move forward through this pandemic. And we've seen artists and arts organizations really show us their best work and being able to move forward. We're very grateful that the city of Tucson mayor and council have entrusted the arts foundation to be able to distribute very quickly um, an arts portfolio of $750,000 to support individual artists and arts organizations at a time when financial need is at its all time high. So we were, uh, we're still in the first phase of processing um, the, the, the final aspects of the, of the grants program and artists um, who are Tucson residents or have a studio in Tucson and um, South Tucson and nonprofit arts organizations who are also residents in Tucson were each able to apply for $10,000 grants and artists up to $2,000 each. Um, right now at this first phase, what we're seeing so far is that based on those caps of 2,008,000 ,000, eligible applicants have requested a total of $668,000 uh, and that includes over $400,000 from arts and culture organizations and uh, close to a quarter of a million dollars from individual artists. What this means 
um, is that that request is only a small percentage of the actual loss that we are seeing in the nonprofit arts and culture sector. What artists have been reporting is a loss of at least $1.5 million and in aggregate arts organizations are reporting a loss of at least $18 million. And this is, um, these are statistics from March estimated December. So it means that on average, just based on the small um, a case study, if you will, of applicants. Uh, there's an average of $1,000, essentially, that artists reported loss and an average of $400,000 that um, arts organizations have lost. In some instances, it's larger. In some instances, it's lower. Well, what I wanted to share with you today is based on our previous partnership with the city, uh, city council and mayor um, took another bold leap to invest an additional $350,000 to support venues and stages. Um, understand that facilities costs, especially when uh, convening is uh, not necessarily an optimal, uh, optimal moment. Um, is not necessarily an optimal option for, for people and, and it's not necessarily a safe option for mass gatherings. Um, here's that venues and facilities are certainly being hit the hardest. So we are in collaboration with the city of Tucson right now to uh, finalize what the guidelines may be to be able to support venues and stages who primarily dedicate their expenditures, their services, their mission to presenting live entertainment. Now the unique uh, opportunity here is that it is not just for nonprofit organizations, but it is also open to businesses in, in the private sector here in Tucson. So we are uh, finalizing those details. Uh, these are for private and nonprofit Offered interactive venues and stages to cover direct losses incurred between March 1st through December 31st. Again, these are costs due to this interruption. Uh, you must be based in the city of Tucson or city of South Tucson. At the very least, your organization would have at least 51% of its expenditures dedicated um, to hosting and, and primarily presenting live entertainment. And um, there's also the option of being able to request up to $50,000 uh, of any Somosuno We Are One resiliency funds. And um, of course, priority will be given to business or businesses who are locally owned. If you are interested or know qualify for these grants, knowing that no further guidelines are, are being uh, finalized as we speak, uh, please visit us at our website, uh, which I'll put in the chat link um, at the end of the call, artsfromtucson.org, and make sure you sign up for our newsletter so that you can get that alert right away. That's awesome, yeah. Thank you. I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but um, let's go ahead and let us share with you a quick national view, if you're, if that's, if, if that's okay, Barbara. So uh, the Brookings Institute just published a study called Lost Art: Measuring COVID-19 Impact on America's Creative Economy, and what we learned here nationally, there are more than 100 billion, 150 billion dollars in sales that have been lost in the first four months of the pandemic, and that amounted to 2.7 million jobs. Tucson of the 53 metropolitan cities studied nation, nationally, Tucson third um, at a loss of 34.6% jobs lost in the creative industries and is ranked sixth nationally in terms of jobs lost in creative occupations. So proportionally, Tucson is experiencing a very devastating hit due to the creative economy. No, not due to the creative economy, I'm sorry, due to the pandemic. And we're gonna get through this through with the creative economy. So um, just wanted to offer you my email and my um, website here and our phone number in case I can answer any questions or if you, if you wanna refer people to the Arts Foundation website to be prepared for the launch of the $350,000 grant program please use this information. Great.
Thank you, Adriana. And it, it is, um, you know, it came, it, it, it became clear, I guess, as, as I started talking to many of our nonprofits with the live venue operations that they were going to struggle bringing performers back because it's not only is it is it the challenge for our audience to participate, but then the performers, right, and, and how they are gathering or not gathering uh, in order to, you know, bring their art form forward. And so some of those may not, we may not see those audiences back in front of those live performers maybe until next summer. Is that kind of what you're seeing? I mean, where are bookings going? What's happening with the theater and those kinds of things? There's a couple of things happening concurrently. One is that theaters and um, performing based organizations that are able to uh, purchase equipment, adapt to the new normal in terms of, of the size, um, they're still facing fixed costs and distribution costs that um, add to the expenses and if even if they're able to open to the public they're opening to the public at such a minimum capacity that they're it really puts into question what the return on investment is and whether or not it's a viable business opportunity additionally our performing organizations are um, are having to wait on the distribution networks that offer the artistic programming um, and the excellent touring options that they bring to our communities and that our communities take advantage of too as our individual artists are also waiting for that green light for their touring opportunities um, to, to be launched. So there's, I can see three things are happening. One is, is it viable for an organization to stay open at a minimum capacity? Two, um, they're waiting for the national distribution networks to green light actual touring opportunities. And three, we have organizations that actually have to go dark, but they still have fixed costs that they're having to pay, um, not just you know, for the facilities, but also um, making the, the, the decision to keep their staff on board. And I am a firm believer that whatever it is that we can do to help our organizations get through this moment and the people that work in these organizations, because these organizations are made up of artists and administrators and people who have families. We need to find ways of being able to keep people employed, of being able to allow organizations to have a moment to plan and pause. Um, I think that there's a, lo a lot of expectations that we can start to rethink right now of how it is that we can actually start to remediate things so that we can um, exist into the future in a responsible, sane way, because surge capacity is real, people. No, that's awesome. Uh, you said exactly what I was thinking in terms of how we can support right now, because we know our arts organizations contribute to the fabric of the community, one that attracts people, attracts business. It, it's a core component of, of what really is economic development as we go uh, forward. It, it's it's what's the essence as well of Tucson. And so we want to be sure to do that. So definitely put your contact information so that organizations and artists can um, to reach out to you about the programs that you have mentioned. I would ask you to do the same. Any contact information that you can add would be fantastic. And uh, because we know there's support there, there's programs there, there's financial assistance. And I want to be sure that uh, everyone has information on that. Um, so I'm looking for, um, you know, it looks like we've had, um, there's a question from Kelly. I'm going to have this question and then we'll wrap it up. Um, how are Saka and the Puma Arts Foundation or Tucson Arts Foundation helping promote social distancing and masking with live performances? Um, the, you know, how do you have musicians and singers uh, take this seriously uh, as well as audiences? So are you having, if you can be brief, are, are you having luck there? It, it, will it, are we learning how to do this, Kate, or I don't know. I know they're nervous. I mean, we have hosted an in-person event until a weeks ago, and, but it's a conversational. It's in fundamentally the arts is how do especially smaller arts organizations with very little resources police these types of things. And 
uh, what's the comfort level. So I know that uh, we feel really honored in that a lot of everything was collaborative, typically partnering with another business resources to help enforce some of the social distancing as well in, as invested. So for example, at the mall here, um, she's a mom and completely proactive from day one. They have actually officers patrolling the facility in doors, having asked the people that they don't have them. Um, so they've been real helpful for us to be able to do our job with limited resources. Um, as well as the shopping center that collaborated most recently with some more open air outdoor events. Um, we haven't had any performance of those. Uh, they do enforce the mask requirements. Uh, and we hope that we will continue to partner uh, with both municipal uh, partners, government partners, as well as business partners to us do that. Because it's not something that any one of us can do alone is police support. And, you know, it's going to take community effort of participatory um, conversation right. to, to make it work. I appreciate that. I'm going to wrap us up so we can get everyone out on time. And I want to thank our panelists. Thank you all uh, for being with us today and sharing your insights. It was inspiring. It was interesting. It was great data. And uh, we're going to keep supporting you. So thank you for all that you do. So with that, um, check your email inbox for next Monday. We'll be back together with our webinar next Monday at 3 p.m. and talk more lending and financial assistance with, with Business Development Finance Corporation and the Tucson IDA. And so register when you see that email invite in your inbox. In the meantime, stay connected with us at connecttucson.com for resources so we can keep you going through this pandemic. Thank you all. Have a great day.